I'm David Holcomb. Uh, I work for Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I am uh, a technical expert on molten salt reactors. I've been working on them for more than a decade now and um, generally knowledgeable about the uh, technologies that are used for them and uh, hopefully can be helpful uh, to the companies who are trying to develop them. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is David Holcomb. Uh, I work for Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, I work on molten salt reactors and have for the past 15 years or so. Um, my technical areas of expertise are really in molten salt reactors and the technologies necessary for building them and hopefully commercializing them in the relatively near term. How would you say things have changed over the last five years? Well, the U.S. Department of Energy founded a campaign on molten salt reactors is one of the biggest things for uh, uh, me. Uh, and so they're actually working on molten salt reactors again. Uh, part of the other things that are going on really since 2012 is that a number of other companies have come out publicly that they are working on molten salt reactors and trying to develop them. Um, they've really, many of these companies actually did exist prior to 2012, unless it's Skunk Works type projects. Uh, and now they are they're all saying we're intending to put power onto the grid other things that are happening that are different now is the university programs have expanded rather significantly department of energy is also now investing in both solid fuel and liquid fuel uh reactors and that's a technical difference from what we were doing in 2012 we had a single large uh, integrated research project uh, on uh, the solid fuel variants of molten salt reactors, but DOE wasn't spending any money on liquid fueled systems. Of course, when you're doing this uh, is when the... Oh, he's just driving by, okay. Okay. Right. You can either continue your thought or talk how the conference has changed over the years. Okay, well, the conference uh, we just had was the fourth in these series of annual meetings that uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy through GAIN is sponsored at Oak Ridge National Laboratory on molten salt reactors. We're trying to bring together industry and the universities and national lab researchers and provide a forum. I mean, there are open conferences. I think investors sometimes show up there generally to provide a snapshot of where the technologies are in molten salt reactors. Uh, we did actually have one in 2010 as well, but it was limited to the salt cooled reactors at the time. How else would you contrast it? It certainly has grown. Uh, you know, we're now mostly building limited. I don't know how many people would come if we really, uh, you know, unlimited uh, entrances now because the fire marshal tells us you can't have more than 250 people there and we're sort of getting to the, the real limits now. There, I think we were someplace around 80 in 2010. Uh, and mostly it was the universities and very small amount of industrial uh, represent, uh, representation. There we had a couple of vendors, I think Haynes was there and they make materials for, uh, for reactors in 2010. Uh, but here we've got several reactor developers uh, and you know, people are starting to bring engineering uh, directors to here. Um, though I think in all cases this is also a really nice recruitment spot for the uh, for the students because you get a lot of the companies and they're all uh, you listen on the side meetings and they're pitching for you know, students to get find a job. How has your work changed over the years? Well mostly we moved from being a technical area where it was a rather small thing and I was sort of off by myself doing this to me being part of a larger program. Um, I mostly concentrate now on helping uh, the overall campaign to do things uh, in the university area to try to coordinate university work and the U.S.'s international projects. Uh, but, uh, you know, so largely it's grown and I've sort of shifted sideways uh, a bit in doing things. What would you say uh, the challenges are towards commercializing molten salt reactors today and has that evolved? Sort of the commercialization challenges you know, remain uh, you know, similar uh, on there. You, someone actually has to do the design work. It's, you know, if you look, it's a fairly hard uh, road to hoe, meaning that there's uh, you know, 
as you saw the the presentations uh, last couple of days, they were in indicating, you know, there's north of a billion dollars someone's going to be spending to uh, get to take the technology from where it is to uh, into an engineering uh, outfit. Uh, there have been a number of things that have improved. I mean, the the nu U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission was not in 2010 really looking at okay, how do we adapt our licensing process to uh, to these advanced reactors with very different safety characteristics than the light water reactors? They were really focused on the current fleet, and now they're re recognizing that they have a number of potential applicants that are coming up who are, are saying, well. I don't have uh, the equivalent uh, you know, accident sequence of the large brake loca. I don't have an equivalent of a small brake loca. And we need to adjust our uh, licensing to be reflective of the safety characteristics of the plants that they're asking them to license. And that's a real big change because it might mean that uh, you know, these highly passively safe plants uh, can have a you know, much different licensing regime. Off the top of your head, can you uh, cite an example of one licensing thing that has changed? Well, right now, we just, uh, Bill Reckley, who is the, the NRC representative there, was indicating that uh, one of the, they, they, they've just going before the commission a something called functional containment, which basically means that uh, you get to evaluate uh, what are the barriers and bring uh, uh, between not releasing the radionuclides to the public and tailor them to the actual, well, gee, this is a salt, don't want to let the salt out, uh, but it's a low pressure system. And so I don't have uh, this uh, a requirement for the meter and a half thick of reinforced concrete to, in order to separate uh, from the uh, from the environment, uh, and and so they they would tailor the requirements for the uh, for the actual reactor. This is also called uh, risk informed, performance based. Uh, that's the general cat uh, categorization of how the NRC is seeking to uh, make its licensing more appropriate for the reactor class. Uh, and it's not a fit done deal yet. So the NRC is still in the process, and so the staff is making recommendations, and then uh, goes to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, and then from there the Commission has to issue rulings. But because the Atomic Energy Act gives the Commission such broad powers, there's really not a need for new laws. It's a matter of essentially working the system. They need to go ahead and go through, okay, what are our rules? How does it, what's specific to a light water reactor about this? What do I have to modify to say, well, you, uh, this isn't something boils at 100 C. This boils at 1430 C. I'm no place near that. I'm not at 2200 PSI. Uh, it, it's just a very different system and I need to make my regulations reflect the actual system. I can imagine there's a lot of knock-on effects on uh, just having that regulation being uh, adapted to support um, non-light water reactors. Can, can you articulate any of them? Like, what does it mean for a company trying to build a molten re salt reactor to have the regulations change, even if it's not specifically the process of, uh, you know, um, making a submission to the NRC? Like, the kind of knock-on effects? If you don't need to go ahead and do things like uh, dual connection to the grid. Well, that's a requirement under the uh, Appendix A criteria, uh, and your plant has to shut down if you don't have dual connection to the grid. Well, if you don't need safety grade power, there's no reason to do that. So there are a lot of things which are just a bit different from the safety characteristics. And so you'll see things like, well, perhaps this system can be used to help black start a grid if there's been an interruption. That's not something you can do with today's plants. I'm thinking also in terms of the ability to raise uh, capital, the, the ability to explain to investors how long things will take or what, what the actual roadmap is for, for regulation. It would be very nice that we were all done with all these changes. Right now, um, you know, 
the NRC hasn't completed its transition, and it will be entirely up to uh, the decisions of the commission. So uh, right now, the, uh, it's a bit of a challenge for the companies, uh, simply because you're trying to hit a moving target. That's much like uh, I'm the chair of the ANS 20.2. We're trying to develop a design safety standard for liquid fuel molten salt reactors. And we're actually on pause a bit right now because the NRC is in the process of changing its rules. And if we write the standard to the old set of rules, uh, well, they could become obsolete almost immediately. And if we write them where we guess what the new set of rules are going to be, well, then we might be wrong and we have to redo it anyway. So we're kind of hoping to, uh, to wait a few more months and let things resolve. And then we'll try to write the standard so it's for what the actual sets of rules are. The 1958 book, Fluid Fuel Reactors, do you think uh, that has any value today? Oh, yes. Among other things, it's a great archive uh, that's easily to re read of what we were doing in the 1950s. Fluid Fueled Reactors is an overview uh, book on just what it says, fluid fuel reactors. We've been working on aqueous homogeneous reactors and molten salt reactors. I think it's got some on some of the liquid bismuth reactors that uh, Brookhaven mostly had been working on. Uh, and so it just gives you a technical overview of the work that had been done up to 1958. I mean, last time I did, I looked up, uh, you know, valve design efforts and trying to look that up. Yeah, they're in ORNL reports, but the ORNL reports are extremely dense and extremely long, and it's just faster to go ahead and grab, gee, they wrote me a nice summary textbook on the subject. It's like going back and reading the original reports takes more time and effort. So I, uh, you know, I say recently, just a couple of months ago, I, uh, I pulled it out just because it's a nice, well, this is, you know, textbooks on subjects are, are nice to have. Do you actually have a physical copy in your room? No, I don't. Uh, don't. That's not one I've pulled up. Uh, I, I, I'm also electronic mostly because if I can hit, uh, you know, use search, it helps my memory a lot more than the paper copies. So I have fairly limited numbers of paper copies. Do you have a PDF? Yep, I have a PDF. Because Addison Wesley, or I think it was Addison Wesley, was the publisher. In the front covers, it says something like, "We assign the copyright to uh, to, to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission." So. I have been talking to the Department of Energy lawyers, and they. Uh, say that's not something that's in public domain. <laughs> it's transferred to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, so Department of Energy is the successor agency to that, and so they'll get to say what it is. Is the Atomic Energy Commission effectively the Department of Energy today, or are they considered different entities? Well, it is a successor agency to the Atomic Energy Commission, so is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, and exactly you know, how the reorganization from the 1973 revision of the Atomic Energy Act is something you're going to need to ask a lawyer. I couldn't tell you, uh, you know, what rights went with whom. What books would you recommend someone read today? Um, if, if they wanted to learn about molten salt reactors, how does one go about learning about molten salt reactors? I'm not sure there's really good intro material uh, on there. There's, you know, certainly uh, some of the websites are pretty good on there. Uh, there I use uh, you know, what is nuclear, the World Nuclear uh, Energy Association. Uh, there, there are just a number of websites that give you the, you know, the 10, 15 minute articles uh, on there. And if you want to start going deeper on there, you can start reading, you know, a number of the ORNL reports. Those are now available through the Office of Scientific and Technical Information. They're, uh, you know, the design reports on the molten salt reactor experiments, the design reports on the molten salt breeder reactor. Uh, they're just, uh, th there's a wealth of information if you want to go deeper into this. How are the original researchers holding up? We lost Dick Engel. Uh, I did get to speak to Sid Ball and Yuri Gatt at the conference. Is there, is there anyone else I should try to reach out to? I believe Bob Hightower is still doing okay. Um, let's see, who else can I think of that's still doing okay? I haven't talked to Mac Toth in, uh, in the last year. Um, 
you might talk to folks who are about one generation older than me who had them as direct who had them as direct supervisors. Uh, you might talk to, for example, Dane Wilson still lives in Oak Ridge. Well, he's a retiree. Uh, he works now for Thorcon. And he, because he was a few years older than me, a lot of the folks who worked there were still in, uh, were still around when he uh, first showed up. Uh, when I first arrived, most everyone had retired, and so I got to know them as retirees, as opposed to, yes, Sid was on my floor, and I got to know Sid the first day I arrived. And so I've uh, been drip fed molten salt reactors for more than 25 years now, but. Uh, most of the folks, I believe Dick Engel retired uh, the year I showed up. Uh, and Paul Haubenreich, about that same time. Um, you know, there say, and, and most of the other folks had left uh, even earlier uh, there. There were the few odd folks who had been around that I got to meet that uh, that were you know, very uh, senior that weren't, but they weren't so much involved with the uh, molten salt reactor program. They were the history of nuclear power because Oak Ridge, essentially all the reactors have you know, some ties to us. What, do you, do you drive any research yourself? Are you, are you, do you consider yourself a researcher or are you more in a managerial role right now? I do a bit of both. Uh, it depends upon what I'm being called upon to do. Some of the things that I do are to help coordinate the research of the universities and help you know, create the technical calls. On the other hand, uh, I've also got a, a molten salt corrosion monitor that I'd really like to get developed uh, this year because uh, I think it's a really cool way of watching you know, pipe corrosion develop. Uh, so it depends upon the particular moment, uh, but I mostly am now um, more advising more junior people than I am getting to put my hands on things. I, I hear a lot of people uh, saying that there is no corrosion problem, and I assume they mean there is no corrosion problem as is commonly understood, and there's still corrosion challenges. Uh, do you think there's any misperceptions about misconceptions about the nature of corrosion and molten salt? Well, it, by, I believe I, there's some quotes from some of our rather lead researchers from as early as 67 that you know, we'd been running a major corrosion program for 15 years by then and we basically understood how corrosion and fluoride salts worked. We know what the rules are and basically uh, what you're going to have to do, have to do. That's not to say uh, uh, you know, that there's a deep science understanding of all of the mechanisms, not to mention the fact we kind of like to make things cheaper. Uh, and if you understand, well, what is my, the limit of this uh, and, and how clean do I have to be? Uh, the fact that I understand that if we are extremely clean, uh, we can essentially very strongly limit the corrosion in fluoride salts. We got less understanding of some of the things in chloride salts, uh, but we still have a relatively strong technical underpinning. I mean, you look at the, the difference between the, the motivations of the companies. Some of them are saying that you know, we're trying to go commercial in by 2030. Well, that's because we've got an adequate understanding. Do we have a perfect one? No, but we, uh, and can we do better? Sure. Uh, do I think we can safely run a, uh, a fluoride salt loop where it's not going to corrode, uh, you know, effectively? Well, yeah, we do a pretty good job with that. We've been doing that, you know, since the mid 1960s. The MSRE had very low corrosion. We demonstrated it's possible. Is it practical? Well, we haven't run a big system for, and we haven't run a 40-year uh, year reactor. I, I don't know yet, and that's sort of what the point of the new system is, is that turning this from a scientific curiosity where you have some very, very talented people babying it a great deal to something which is going out industrially and generating a lot of watts uh, and doing it profitably. That's sort of the difference between the 1960s and today.
I'm continually amazed by the, the broad ranges of how people are trying to commercialize reactors which use molten salt coolant. Um, can you articulate for us the some of the choices people are making when they decide what kind of reactor they're going to make? Okay, this is one of the things, is that molten salts are a general class of reactor. It's much like water reactors are have so many different types of things, ranging the aqueous homogeneous reactors to the can-do reactor to uh, you know pressurized water reactors. Well, in a molten salt reactor, we can do liquid fuels, we can do solid fuels cooled by liquid salt, we can do salt that's in a tube and the coolant goes around it, and so it's a natural circulation effort within the tube. We can do a pump loops, we can do ones that are thermal spectrum, we can do ones that are fast spectrum. We can have ones that are intended to just be fed with uh, depleted uranium because they're after their initial uh, fueling, because they're such a hard spectrum. Uh, it, it is difficult to underestimate how many different variants there are, and there are different advantages to each one of them, which is part of why there's so many different companies trying to push this. And that's going to be one of the challenges of how do you shake out who's going to be commercially successful because, simply put, these don't look like each other. Uh, and they don't look like necessarily what we did in the 1960s. I uh, recently watched a, a clip of you where you uh, mentioned that you got uh, interested in nuclear power uh, by reading an Isaac Asimov story. I might be mischaracterizing what you said. Well, yeah, that was one of the things is that I always knew I was going to be an engineer. That's just sort of built in, uh, you know, you know, as what's it, you read the Dilbert cartoon, he's got the knack. Well, that was just, uh, that was, I always knew science or engineering was going to be where I was doing, and you're looking for what, how can you make a difference? And yeah, I like to read science fiction uh, growing up, and one of the things that Isaac Asimov sort of brought in is that what happens if you've got large amounts of power at low, uh, you know, at very low cost. And what are the impacts of that? And then you start looking at what are the impacts to society of, of, of for this. And you get a better correlation uh, with quality of life with inexpensive energy than anything else. It's even a little bit better than health care. And so you say, well, yeah, this is something I'd like to work on. I'd like to help. And so... Yeah, that's I've kind of been directed towards uh, advanced nuclear power for you know since I was a child. Well, is there a, a fictional work you think that does a good job of explaining an ener a perspective on energy you have? Like I kind of reference Star Trek a lot, but that might miss the mark, you know. I'm not sure there's a really good uh, description. I mean, most of the movies today, if you look there, big on the dystopian future about the collapse of society and such, and this sort of gradual progression from, gee, 1% of the society was doing okay to now we're in the very high fractions of society of people are doing are not starving in the in the uh, you know the wealthier countries and even in the less developed countries we're slowly bringing more and more people in and that doesn't make really good stories because slowly everybody getting a little bit better uh, is uh, you know, just doesn't sell very well you know and you know, we're even hearing more about you know what are the potential environmental uh, you know catastrophes of what we're doing well. The catastrophe ends of things rather than, okay, how does human ingenuity help with solving that? Just the, the catastrophe sells more. I know that uh, some uh, fiction writers like Neil Stephenson, for example, they're actively trying to coordinate the creation of positive uh, science fiction <laughs> because they see it can have a positive impact. Uh, that those guys who write science fiction today they were, they were impacted by kind of the positive sci-fi that they grew up with. The combination of being engaged at work and having a couple of small children has kind of t taken me out of, of appreciating much of the popular cult culture uh, for the last few years. I got one for you, but it's not necessarily a positive outlook book, but uh, if you ever get a chance to read The Three-Body Problem... Okay. Do you think there's a misconception the public has about nuclear power that, that it's possible to address? Like, uh, as, as I'm a guy trying to communicate uh, molten salt reactors and nuclear power, 
do you think there are approaches that were were missing or you know what what works what have you found works i mean the biggest thing that i have is that most of the people are actually trying to do a good job we are actually trying to help this isn't some uh, uh i i i see more pictures of people being perceived as this is a uh, you know, terrible thing being imposed upon people, but I, much like the regulators, you know, part of the reason that the regulators hold people to high standards is that they sign their name at the bottom of this and say, I believe this is true, that this is adequately safe. And most of the people who are working on this are really good people who are trying hard to do their best. And I, I think that that is something that might not be captured by uh, some of the popular perception that these are you know, sort of ordinary people who are working in an area and they're trying to help. Kirk said that the reason he was able to proceed with his, his research was because the, the nature of the, uh, the funding changed that they, they kind of opened it up to say, what would you like to fund as opposed to mandated? Is that... Do you ha I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but do you have any observations about the, how the nature of funding has changed to conduct research? I mean, you can look track funding histories. We're, you know, there right now. Nuclear power has you know got I think in the last budget roughly 100 million dollars in the advanced reactor program. Some fraction of that goes to molten salt reactors, uh, and you know it's still. It's the decision by Congress for how much money is going to go into there. It's not, you know, you know other than being a citizen in one vote, uh, you know, I don't have special insight to tell people that, uh, you, know, you know, what Congress is to do. It's not my, uh, the purpose of my job to go ahead and, you know, and try to influence Congress. We're trying to help with given the resources that we have to do the best job we can with advancing the overall goals when, you know, the mission statements are very positive. They tell about trying to use nuclear energy and enable uh, this to help uh, the, the, the generation of electric power in the U.S. I, you know, so, yeah, the budgets in the past had been larger. That was a choice that was made, you know, in the 70s and 60s of the Congress and the people at that point. Uh, I can't say. Well, I'm 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 thinking like in terms of 2012. I don't know if you're thinking like in the 60s or if oh, you're thinking in the 60s. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm working in molten salt reactors. I am pleased the U.S. government is supporting the effort, you know, the area that I'm working on. That's you know, it's very self-serving to say that, and I, you know, don't expect people to go ahead and you know take anything more uh, than. Uh, you know, then I think that molten salt reactors have a tremendous possibility of helping humanity, and that's kind of why I'm working in them. But you're going to need to make your own, people need to make their own judgments about uh, how good things are, and not just because you know I'm that uh, the fact is I'm getting money from the taxpayer to do work. Uh, yeah, I recognize that that's uh, you know I've got a, a huge conflict of interest. Uh, on this and that, so I'm pleased to see people who are like you, who are reporters and the like, taking a look, seeing you know what's good, and getting independent uh, outsiders to take a look at things, as opposed to just uh, people who are like me, who are very much uh, in the inside. And yeah, I'll tell you, I think it's a very positive thing, but it's also in my financial interest for that. I mean, that's what I do for a living. I'm. Um, oh, I was. Um kind of uh, just trying to get you to confirm like is it is it factual uh, I mean I don't want to suss you out opinions on budgets that you're not supposed to to have opinions on or, or speak them but more like just as a factual observation since the last time I was at Ornell it was 2012 uh, how has funding changed the US and last about a year and a half ago decided to have a molten salt reactor campaign ie it's direct it's directing its funding specifically towards molten salt reactors uh, there are also a number of efforts for the universities there are some uh, industry funding opportunity announcements there are more there's more directed funding towards uh, molten salt reactors now than there was in 2012 absolutely 
Um, DOE also was doing essentially the background types of things back there. I mean, advanced materials. That was still a, a topic area in 2012. It just wasn't necessarily advanced materials focused on molten salt reactors. I was extremely excited when uh, Ornell posted that documentary that was looked like it was produced in the, the 60s uh, about the molten salt reactor. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, they've, we, the, two, the two videos, we had one of them on the overview of the molten salt reactor experiments and the one on remote operations and maintenance at molten salt reactors. We, uh, I actually, as a geek, really like the second one too because it really showed uh, the capabilities that we had and that we understood this is highly radioactive near there. Can you do things like replace a pipe or replace a heat exchanger? And being able to show that in 1959, I was very impressed. What all can you tell me about how, it, like, what's the process where uh, that was found or that was dug up? I, I don't have any story behind the recovery of that. Well, largely, uh, government doesn't throw things away, or at least it's not supposed to. And there it was, a, a vault. Uh, the Y-12 plants and the ORNL plant used to be one company, and they found a collection of... Uh, Film. I think most of it's 16 millimeter film uh, at Y12 in one of their storage vaults, and they started looking at it and saw, hey, this is uh, about the molten salt reactor experiments, and so uh, they called us over, over, and uh, we went over and looked at them, and they, said, yeah, we'd be very interested in this. Which, uh, which can you digitize this, please? And modern. The challenge is that it's currently over in the classified vaults at Y12 or at least the, the two that we've released, we brought over an export control officer, a couple of subject matter experts, a classification officer, and they, we all watched the movies together and, uh, and then signed the right forms, and then Y12 was nice enough to digitize these and release them. There are, there's a whole pile of more film over there we don't think that there's anything that's really nearly that exciting, but they videoed or, or filmed an awful lot of experiments. Uh, not all of it has any indexes or audio necessarily, and currently it's all in the classified vault, so you have to get somebody with a clearance to look at it, because heaven only knows what could be in there. And uh, it, Frank, it's just it's a fair amount of work to get it out, and because the film is all physically aging, Y12 requires it to be treated very delicately. And so it, we've got a little light table, and you can pass the film across it. And then, uh, and unfortunately, subject matter experts are somewhat expensive. Uh, I think we may have a workaround that some of the retirees that still have clearances may be able to, may be able to go over, but it's going to be entirely to the good graces of Y12. Uh, whether they, you know, the, the plant managers are going to let them in to go ahead and watch the films and identify these are the top few, because a lot of it is just not going to be interesting. As a guy who tries to put videos together, I, I just want to say that uh, the documentary is incredibly useful. Like, uh, you know, the nature of B-roll and just cutting to different visuals while someone's talking. Combine that with footage of what was an operating molten salt reactor or people doing uh, research like it's sort of a I think there's like a meta problem where uh, we have a hard time showing people uh, what we're talking about and you have to fall back on a lot of CGI and, and drawings and stuff like that. Uh, you know, even today's research at Ornell, uh, those or the, like, for example, the photos we saw uh, lined up, right? So one of those photos, uh, the one I think Reluca submitted, or the team with Reluca submitted, and it had the frozen salt uh, spheres, droplets, uh, like that was video. And uh, she gave me uh, access to the video and let me use it in her presentation, not the Ornell presentation, but one she gave somewhere else. And I thought it made a world of difference to actually be able to show what she was talking about. Well, I'm hopeful that there are a couple of, uh, of the experiments which I'm pretty sure were filmed that we can find the film of. The, uh, particularly some of the ones for the aircraft reactor accident evaluation. Because in 1955, 
uh, folks did irradiate some fuel salt, mixed it in to dilute it, but then just poured it out in an open pit. And then with a whole bunch of detectors around it, uh, and essentially didn't see any radiation releases. And we're not going to do an experiment like that ever again. Uh, but if we can find the film of them actually doing that, that's going to be an amazingly effective thing to show. Uh, and, and this was uh, trying to mimic what would happen if an, uh, if an aircraft reactor actually crashed. And so they've got stuff about does it boil massively because they dumped it in a uh, tank with water and seeing what the violent boiling was like versus... And they, but they, they've got a number of those types of experiments. And thus far, I haven't seen the film of that. But again, there were a couple of pot stacks of film canisters, and I have not gone through all the film canisters. It sounds very exciting when you say that there are stacks of film canisters. <laughs> um, what about ongoing research? Is there, is there any way Ornell could facilitate uh, fo footage that doesn't um, like divulge proprietary information? It's the same way that you guys share photos on Flickr and well, stuff. I mean, for the technical community, you know, we release technical reports. I mean, the campaign is exactly, you know, is one year old now. And so it turns out everybody writes their reports right at the end of the year. And so a number of them are still stuck in the bottleneck of public release. Uh, but the Office of Scientific and Technical Information gets everything because that's, you know, this is paid for by the taxpayers. So unfortunately, that version of stuff is not exactly easily accessible to the public. And I will have to say, we're not very good uh, at the, uh, if you want to say, how do I explain this to members of the public? Well, what we're paid to do is to resolve technical issues. And that's generally, you know, they're, they're just, that's not what we do. And I would, you know, It'd be nice to think we would, and I did indeed you know, take the message from some of the vendors that if DOE would improve its public-facing websites, it would be helpful to them. I'm not going to make any promises, because I, I can't, but uh, I, I heard that. And we'll see what we can do about improving some of our public-facing messages for, that are e more easily interpreted by you know, technically interested members of the public. Uh, you know, otherwise, I encourage you to just go to the OSTI website and, or, and just start you know, searching for you know, the 19, you know, 2018 uh, reports. Uh, and there'll be a number of molten salt reactor reports. I think you know, 15 or so of them uh, were released, which are campaign documents. And they'll, you know, within the next few months, everything will be out. Well, I, I thought Ornell was doing actually, uh, I don't really have a frame of reference, but there are so many photos uh, I'm just saying I, I'm not sure that there's any process Ornell goes through where uh, video is captured regularly uh, as part of the experiments. It might, if, if, if every lab act, if every piece of research had to have like three pieces of video associated with it, uh, I don't know what those video clips would be, but it would probably help tell stories in different mediums. I don't disagree that we could do a much better job with public outreach on there. But again, that isn't so much what we have been tasked to do. We try to fulfill, this is what the mission statement was, and you know, this is what our, the scope and objectives of the, of the, of the project uh, are. And uh, I think we could do better with that. And I don't disagree that we probably should. Um. You uh, told me that you thought that there were some misconceptions about Alvin Weinberg and what he said and what he didn't say. Do you want to uh, clarify your view of the man? Or I mean, I find Alvin Weinberg, you know, if I read his stuff, as an absolutely inspirational leader. Uh, he, his concern for people from day one uh, just uh, was remarkable. I look at the safety things that were put in the uh, in, in the absolute first reactor, in the graphite pile, and the evaluation of, of, of safety and the uh, impact on humans and the impact on the environment was you know, deeply embedded in all of Alvin's work. And I mean, I never really knew the man. I mean, he was a, a revered figure by the time I got here and retired. Uh, 
but uh, if you read his work and you see his liter and you see his developments, uh, you know it was obvious that you know any modern concerns about the environment and uh, you know or you know humans and the people you know have very strong uh, representation in what he he believed you know from the beginning of the nuclear age. Do you have any um, observations that you would like to share? There are some very serious, very talented people working on molten salt reactors in commercial companies. I think highly of a, no uh, of a number of these uh, commercial efforts, and I'm hopeful that a number of them succeed. I think that they have tremendous possibilities, but we're still early phase. Nobody has uh, even an integral effects test facility built yet. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, there's a lot of work needs to be done by the by the regulators. There, uh, all of the supply chain, uh, all the developers. But we're moving in a positive direction. Uh, direction. So I'm not yet willing to. You know, uh, this is not all sunshine and roses yet uh, here. And but I really hopeful that somebody by 2030 is going to have a molten salt reactor generating watts on the grid and I'm hoping to still be alive then so I would like to see that so I go ahead and I you know that's one of the things when I realize I'm well over halfway through my career now and I very much you know I chose advanced reactors and power generation as a small boy and I don't want to have career failure I don't want to, at the end of my life, to say, no one built an advanced reactor, and I didn't help. And so I'm generally optimistic about this, and would, you know, and that's why I'm staying around. I'm trying to help, uh, and so that may be helping with the, you know, the, the regulation now, it's helping with the technology, it's you know, helping with the, this, you know, the safeguards and the international aspects. The, you know, they're just... There's, a, there's plenty of work to go around yet. If someone was younger than myself and uh, heading into school and finds molten salt reactors to be a, a topic of interest, how would you, what would you recommend they do? How, how would, should they proceed? First, just get your technical chops. I mean, absolutely, you've got to have, you know, science, technology, uh, you know, the whole realm of the STEM uh, disciplines. I mean, the things that you see a little bit differently for us, a little bit more physical chemistry, uh, a little bit more metallurgy than you would probably have in most of the other one, uh, uh, things, uh, because most nuclear engineering programs do an awful lot of math and an awful lot of physics. Yeah, you need those. But in a molten salt reactor, you also need public policy, regulation. Some of these things you'll learn, uh, you know, as you come in, out into your career, but you know, start with having a good solid educational foundation. Uh, and then you have to decide how your life wants to go. Do you want to work for a regulator? Do you want to work for a small startup? Do you want to work for a large company? They all have pluses and minuses. Uh, minuses, And so that's why we have this great free society and people get to choose what they're going to do. Uh, you know, I recognize at the moment that there, you know, we're at a very unfinished phase of things, and we don't have good uh, you know, public documentation, which uh, is, uh, you know, the sales pitch thing. Well, that's not what we do. I, uh, and, but on the other hand, I do think that we should be pr pr putting out information which is re more readily accessible. Uh, it'd be a useful thing to do. Um, I'd you know, like to think that you know, 20, 30 years from now, you know, when my kids are you know, in the leadership positions, that, hey, this is an accomplishment, and you have a check mark next to it, and uh, that your uh, molten salt reactors are you know, sort of commonplace, and that you know, they, run, they consume nuclear waste, and uh, you know, all, uh, the full fuel cycle is realized, and that you know, electric power is much, uh, is inexpensive and plentiful, and that uh, you know, we're doing our, our part of reducing the amount of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere. You know, that uh, I'm still generally optimistic about what's going to happen in the future, uh, and hopefully I'm proven right. Okay, Dave, thanks a lot. I'm just going to shake your hand and take your microphone. You're, you're 
you feel comfortable because uh, thanks a lot for all your hard work and thank you so much for talking to me. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, hopefully you know, this, something positive comes yeah. out of it. Are you are you okay with how this went? Like, do you feel the need to screen every anything after? Nah, no, no, they told me. I mean, as long as I don't talk anything about policy and I just talk technology. And yeah. I mean, and Jason told me he didn't need to be there. I've done this enough times yeah. on there that he knows that I, I know that. Okay. I talk technology. That's what I am. Okay. I'm, I'm a geek. I think I think I did better than.